hey guys um so if you have not turned in the questions that were assigned on monday go ahead and submit them asap um there's not going to be a written assignment due tomorrow um just to watch this lecture uh okay so at the end of the last lecture i was talking about um like what was popular in the decade that just ended and I said I added on to the end stuff like Comic-Con and Coachella which is true but now that I'm looking at my notes again I realized what I was talking about was okay so today we're going to talk about like um how pop culture can be used as a good tool used as a positive thing and then in the next lecture we'll talk about it in a negative way um, we'll finish this lecture by watching a video that kind of touches on both. Okay, but so by looking at my notes again, I realized that I was talking about, so effects on society, the first thing is it builds and strengthens interactions with people who are also into the same kind of thing, so people who share hobbies. So that's why I was talking about stuff like Comic-Con. If you don't know what it is, it's where people, like, dress up as characters and go, um, I don't know, to big events, uh, like this, like people get really into it, um, and then, okay, so I put Coachella, but just, um, music festivals in general would work. All right, so events to celebrate pop culture help foster bonds among people of different background, uh, encourages personal growth, so I've never watched Breaking Bad, but, um, I'm sure you guys have heard of it, it's about, like, a chemist, and really that's all that I know, actually, um, but when that show came out, there was a huge increase in people taking chemistry classes because of that show, well, I mean, they think that it was because of that show, because they were directly correlated, but, all right, it also strengthens the economy, or it has the potential to, so think about, like, merch from popular movies, concerts, books, etc., um, even influences food, so the show Friends, there's, like, cafes that copy that show, um, Starbucks sell butterbeer, which is from Harry Potter, and that you can also get butterbeer at, like, Disney World, um, Disneyland and the Harry Potter Land. Okay, pop culture as a tool, so a tool for propagating dissent and bringing, light, bringing to light various social issues that run rampant but are ignored. So if you can see this one, it says, if Harry Potter taught us anything, it's that no one should live in a closet, and then it has the LGBT pride colors on the bottom, um, saying that you should feel comfortable coming out of the closet. Uh, even Voldemort didn't kill 1,200 people in one night, and that's the Pan-African flag in the background. Uh, the women strike back with, like, the Superwoman, um, design on it, so that was either, I think that's part of, like, part of the Me Too movement or something. Okay, and then this was the assignment that you guys did over the past two days with This Is America, and, yeah, so now we're gonna watch a video um, we'll talk about the negative influences in the next lecture. This video is 14 minutes long, so get your popcorn, and then that's the end of this lecture. Hello. When I first saw this product, I thought it looked kind of crazy. Didn't really understand what the benefits would be, but uh, I had seen some before. The first online business I started was selling tutorials on how to make jewelry out of Scrabble tiles. Sounds weird, right? Yep, you're experiencing digital eye strain. Digital eye strain? That's right. Okay, here we go. Maybe. I began my sociology research 
I had a hypothesis. And various people could look at the same exact thing and see something completely different. Now, it seems a little counterintuitive, but let me explain. Ooh. This is a photo of Kendrick Lamar, acclaimed and Grammy-winning hip-hop artist on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. This is also a photo of Kendrick Lamar on the cover of GQ magazine. And as you can tell, these two depictions of the same human being, the same pop culture figure, are quite different. Now, during my experiment, I asked participants to look at each photo and describe what they saw. And more importantly, tell me how they felt, whether or not they liked the photo, and why or why not. So when I showed this photo, I had one participant look at it and said, that's a dope photo of Kendrick. I like it because it's hip hop right there. He looks hardcore. He looks like he's been through a lot. I think the photo is pretty representative of Kendrick. He talks a lot about pain in his songs, struggles and hardships from where he is, people dealing with addiction, and just in general, a rough lifestyle from Compton. I had a second participant look at the same exact photo and say, I know Kendrick a bit because I listen to some of his music. But, beyond, but don't know really much beyond that. His clothes, I think, make him look like a gang member. Gang members might wear clothes like that. He looks confident, but he's not smiling. His hand is in his pocket, which is kind of threatening. We see the same divergence of perception with the second photo. The same first participant said, in this photo, it looks like he's saying, I'm just getting out there. I gotta look clean for the people. I, I gotta put a good impression for the people. I'm going to hold a mic in my hand to let people know that I'm a music artist. He got the skinny tie on with a cheesy smile and a nice fade. But the Kendrick now is not trying to show, uh, put on a show for anyone. He's real. So this looks a little cheesy to me in that sense. I had a second participant look at the same photo and say, I like this photo of Kendrick more than the other one. I just think he looks a little more friendly and welcoming, I guess. The suit makes him look very sharp like he's about to present at the Oscars. He looks happy, and I would want to talk to him. What was really interesting to me is that we have two participants looking at two very different representations of the same figure. And even though they saw the same things, they felt something very different. They used their prior context, their prior life experiences, to inform and rationalize the judgments that they made. They could be looking at the same thing, but seeing something completely different. And this trend continued throughout my experience. These are two depictions of LeBron James, arguably one of the most well-known athletes of our generation. When I show participants these photos, they describe him in the GQ cover as friendly, professional, and welcoming. And they looked at the Vogue cover and described him as angry, aggressive, and intense. Now, here's, here's an interesting phenomenon because now we have everyone, all the participants, who knew LeBron James, who had some prior knowledge of him, look at these two representations and feel something completely different based on how he looked in each photo. So as I was trying to discover the relationship between media and people, I found that this relationship was more complex than I thought. And as I showed participants each image, a pattern began to emerge. While people describe the contents of each photo, with clarity and consistently. They would say, LeBron is wearing a suit, he's smiling, he has a flaming basketball in his hand. The way they felt about it, the conclusions they drew were quite different and based upon their personal experiences. Now what does this say about us? What does it mean that two students from the same university could look at the same exact image and see and more importantly feel something so different? What is the impact of this phenomenon on our everyday lives? You see, I think we take for granted our own worldview, our own perspectives, because they're formed by our own life experiences and the things that happen around us all the time. But we often don't consider the complex relationship that each one of us have with media and how that shapes our perception of reality. As individuals, we've always craved the ability to contextualize our human experience with those around us. We want the ability to say, we want to look at someone and say, 
I see what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're saying, what you're feeling. So that I know how to think, how to act, and how to feel. Not necessarily to mimic those around us, but simply to contextualize who we are, our unique human experience in the spectrum of possibility. And the funny thing is, media has provided us with that ability. That ability to say, I know how to act in this situation. I watch a sitcom, and now I know how to act on a date. I watch the red carpet, and now I know how to act, how to interview, if I ever reach that status. But because of how old we are, where we come from, our race, ethnicity, class, gender, and things that we don't necessarily have control over, because of these factors, we're exposed to different types of media. And not only are we exposed to different types of media, we process this media quite differently. And as a result, we all have unique relationships with media. And because of this, our perceptions of the world diverges from one another. We can be looking at the same facts, the same images, reading the same Facebook statuses, and see and feel something completely different and our social context begin to diverge. So in 2016, a time where most of us are attached to our devices, looking at our screens, media has become this pervasive and constant filter for how we see society, how we see reality. And as we traverse our different lives, it's important to recognize that we each have unique filters. We inhabit unique digital worlds. Even though we sit together here, as part of one Lehigh community. We actually are part of very distant worlds. Our unique filters, as they manifest on our Facebook news feeds, who we follow on Instagram, what news platforms we care about. As a result of this, we inhabit very distinct digital worlds, fit to our exact personalities, feeding into our very specific emotional needs. And I think this is quite problematic. Yeah, when it comes to trivial things like what memes we enjoy, what public figures we like to follow, what Instagram pages we enjoy, our divergent filters have relatively little impact. They're harmless. It doesn't matter that I like to follow one dog Instagram page and you like to follow cats. That doesn't matter. But when it comes to more serious issues and content that require thoughtfulness, discussion, Clarity, empathy, and most importantly, love. Our divergent filters fail us. We self-indulge in these echo chambers and clickbait news articles that only affirm our deepest emotional drives and insecurities. The internet, social media news, these are institutions that at the highest level ideally should be bringing us together as they should free us from the limitations of our immediate physical realities. But instead, we see that they're pulling us apart. I do think it's interesting, however, that people are beginning to place blame as society begins to realize how much they've been played. <laughs> they say the media is dividing us based on things like race, class, politics. Recently, people have been condemning Facebook for not doing a better job in quelling the misinformation that spread like wildfire over the past election season. And ideally, yes, we should hold these platforms, these companies, to a higher standard so that they can provide a service that ultimately leads to social good. But to divert the responsibility that we have and the guilt and blame that we have onto these companies, I would feel that that sentiment is a bit misplaced. Because in the economic, social, and political atmosphere that we live in now, I don't see a future where the role of media will fundamentally change. Because in the systems that are so entrenched in our society, media has become a zero-sum game to grasp moments of our attention. A phenomenon that has led scholars to say that we're living in an attention economy. Media is no longer a service of entertain I mean, media is no longer a service of information, but about entertainment and emotion. 
op-eds, videos, and even these magazine covers that I showed you before are all designed to evoke specific emotions, to spark discussion, outrage, to cause shares, a purchase, ultimately for profit-driven incentives. As a result, when you think about the dynamics that we've been talking about, and bring them in the context of today's theme, which is ignorance. We have to see media as a dual-edged sword. Because on one hand, media has allowed us to transcend our immediate physical realities. It's allowed us to gain exposure to things that we wouldn't have. Media is the reason why people like me and you living in Pennsylvania get to know what is happening in North Dakota and potentially get engaged in that process. I think that's an extremely powerful and good thing. But on the other hand, media, and more specifically, our digital filters, have limited our worldview, feeding us things that we like to see, that we already know. And these dynamics are in constant tension with one another. And the frustrating thing is, the media companies and platforms that we rely on, they're not obligated to resolve this tension. In fact, they're more aligned to exploit it. These media companies offer us suggestions, curating content for us that we know we will enjoy. They shield us from looking at things that might make us use their platform less. They feed into our passions, our insecurities, our ego, and every facet of our complicated identities. Just to make sure that we continue to use their platform, to continue to use their content, in order for us to feel comfortable, self-righteous, and satisfied. So if I'm saying that the blame and responsibility does not fall solely on these companies, the question then becomes, how do we accept and respect the beauty of our divergent digital worlds? How do we reconcile with the fact that me and you, we actually like different things, and we are going to see things differently? How do we respect that fact, and yet, work together, simultaneously bring them together to build unity? How do we learn about the other, the unknown, in a way that is meaningful, authentic, and long-lasting? Because the media has always provided a crutch for us, so that we don't have to do the work, so that we don't have to go in there and engage in the unknown without bias or fear. It inhibits our self-awareness and motivates us to project our insecurities, our ego, our mentality outwards instead of inwards. In order to build unity in this era of divergence caused by our digital worlds, we need to curb our dependence on filtered experiences and instead truly engage and immerse ourselves in direct ones. So, All right, so that's good. And that is the end. Your friends. Um... So yeah, you guys can just think about where you stand on whether or not uh, pop culture is a good thing or a bad thing or a little bit of both. All right.